and welcome to Flash Forward. I'm Rose, and I'm your host. Flash Forward is a podcast about the future. Here is how it works. Every episode, we take on a possible future and try to really overthink what it would actually be like. First, we take a trip to the future to hear what's going on, and then we teleport back to today to talk to real-life experts about what they think that future would be like. Got it? Great. We're not going to go to the future just yet. First, I want to tell you about another podcast that I really like. It is a real one, not a fake future one, and it's called Science Versus. When it comes to controversial topics, there are a lot of opinions. Angry uncles, Facebook posts, and then there is science. Science Versus is a show that finds out what is fact, what is not, and what is somewhere in between. It answers questions like, is fracking that bad? Does the G-spot exist? Is hypnosis real? Does gun control actually work? It's hosted by Wendy Zuckerman and produced by Gimlet Media. Science Versus takes facts seriously, but not itself. So if you want to win the next argument with your angry uncle, listen to Science Versus for free wherever you get your podcasts. That's Science VS. The new season is going to launch in a couple of days on March 9th with two brand new episodes. So go check them out. Okay, now we are going to go to the future. And this episode, we're going to start in the year 2036. Hello, welcome to California. Where are you coming from? Washington, D.C. And where are you staying? At the Millennium Biltmore. Business or pleasure? Uh, business. I'm here for a conference. Do you have a work visa in California? I'm sorry? Do you have a work visa in California? Um, no, I didn't. I'm, I'm just coming for a conference. How long are you staying? Just for the weekend. I leave Sunday night. Okay, in the future, any business trips over three days require a work visa in California. Enjoy your stay. My citizens, it has been a long road to our path to independence, and it will be an even longer road ahead of us. We must undo so many of the things the United States did to cripple our economy, our environment, and our education systems. But we have taken the first step. Together, we have emerged from the rubble of our neighbors with our true Californian spirit unbroken. And we are ready to take on the next day, free of those 49 other states, free of their baggage and their politicians and their infighting. Today is a new day. Today is our day. Long live California. I pledge allegiance to the flag and the Independence Day of California. On my honor, I will be faithful and true allegiance to my country and my people. I will be a true kind of in thought, in word, and in deed. C A L I F O R N I A C A L I F O R N So this episode is about a future where California leads the West in a successful secession movement. Now, this is a future that's been on my list for a while. But since the election here in the United States, it's taken a bit of a different tone. California voted overwhelmingly for Hillary Clinton in the presidential election last year. 66 percent of the people who voted in California cast their votes for her. And as most of you probably know, she did not win. And this is one of the big talking points of many California secessionists. The presidential election is almost always totally decided before California's votes are even counted. So why should California continue to be ruled by a government that it basically doesn't elect? And, they argue, that doesn't really have their best interests at heart. Of course, California isn't the only state that doesn't always get its way, right? That's kind of the whole thing about having 50 different states. Not every state is going to get the elected official that they want. A lot of conservative states can make the same claims that California does. They almost always vote Republican, but they don't always get a Republican president. 
But I want to back up a little bit because secessionist ideas are about as old as America itself. So before we go into the future, let's go back into the past. There are a ton of interesting secessionist movements to pull from from history, but I'm just going to pick one and it's my favorite one. And it's a place called Jefferson. On November 27th, 1941, motorists driving down Interstate 99 just south of Wairika, California, were stopped by mountain men with guns. These guys were handing out a proclamation of independence, which read, You are now entering Jefferson, the 49th state of the Union. Jefferson is now in patriotic rebellion against the states of California and Oregon. This state has seceded from California and Oregon this Thursday, November 27th, 1941. Patriotic Jeffersonians intend to secede each Thursday until further notice. For the next hundred miles, as you drive along Highway 99, you are traveling parallel to the greatest copper belt in the far west, 75 miles west of here. The United States government needs this vital mineral, but gross neglect by California and Oregon deprives us of the necessary roads to bring out the copper ore. If you don't believe this, drive down the Klamath River Highway and see for yourself. Take your chains, shovel, and dynamite. Until California and Oregon build a road into the copper country, Jefferson, as a defense-minded state, will be forced to rebel each Thursday and act as a separate state. Please carry this proclamation with you and pass them out on your way. And it made, of course, for a terrific story with these old late 40s automobiles being stopped by guys with long guns and cowboy hats. That's Peter Lawfer, a journalist and the author of a book called The Elusive State of Jefferson. The story of this armed interception spread like wildfire, which was kind of the point. You see, the whole movement for the independence of Jefferson was run by two guys. The first was a man named Gilbert Gable. The mayor of Port Orford, Oregon, where he had landed looking to make something of himself besides the work he had done back on the East Coast as a PR specialist. And the other was a journalist named Stanton Delaplane a fanciful reporter for a fanciful newspaper at the time, the San Francisco Chronicle. Gable wanted to bring attention to what he saw as a grave injustice. Port Orford and others in Southern Oregon and Northern California were trying to draw attention to their rural plights being disregarded by urban centers. And Delaplane was looking for a story. Stanton Delaplane, the reporter for the Chronicle, saw an opportunity for a story that would not only be fun to report, and he expected fun for his readers, but also a distraction from the kinds of stories that were filling the front pages as the world headed for the Second World War. So they teamed up. So Delaplane went up into the boondocks of Northern California and Southern Oregon and wrote a series of reports that were splashed all over the paper. Delaplane actually won a Pulitzer for his reporting on the Jefferson independence movement. But Lawfer doesn't think that the Pulitzer committee quite realized how involved Delaplane was in kind of creating a lot of the stuff he was actually writing about. He was heavily involved in what we could call today perhaps on the positive side participatory journalism or the White House might call fake news. He engaged his subjects and helped them generate what it is they were up to and what it is they were saying. But either way, the nation was bemused and fascinated by these reports of Jefferson, a rural community pushing back against what they saw as an unfair prioritization of the urban parts of their state. And and this was, all indications are largely imagined by reporter Delaplane and acted out by the locals who were anxious to engage in some frivolity and some frivolity that would draw attention to their legitimate gripes against Salem and Sacramento. Which sounds kind of familiar, right? I mean, that urban-rural divide is something that we are still talking about today in America. And even though this really was a PR stunt, Jefferson even went so far as to appoint a leader. On December 4th, 1941, a guy named John Leon Childs was inaugurated as the first governor of the state of Jefferson. Unfortunately, that was kind of the last success for Jefferson. Two days before Childs was sworn in, Gilbert Gable actually died. And three days after Childs was sworn in, on December 7th, 1941, something happened that completely ended the movement. Yeah, it was very simple. The Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, and suddenly 
a bunch of rogues drawing attention to themselves and their legitimate problems out in the wild west of Northern California and Southern Oregon no longer was germane to anybody's priorities, including their own. Now, today, there is obviously no state of Jefferson, but the idea hasn't died. In fact, if you are driving through that same region of 99 where the men with the long guns and the cowboy hats stopped the cars in 1941, you might catch the local radio station, Jefferson Public Radio. Welcome to As It Was, tales from the mythical state of Jefferson. I mean, after all, this is Jefferson Public Radio. Nick, welcome to the Jefferson Exchange. Good morning, Jeffrey. Jefferson is more a state of mind. It's actually something you can get on a bumper sticker. It's not really a movement these days. In fact, most of these movements seem largely created to draw attention to a perceived injustice rather than to actually break a state or a region away from the rest of America. In 2009, the governor of Texas, Rick Perry, said that seceding from the United States was on the table if the federal government kept ignoring the desires of his state. But really, that was largely meant to posture, to remind the U.S. how valuable Texas is. I feel very confident saying that Rick Perry, who then went on to run for president of the United States, would never really lead Texas in a charge to break away from those United States. But he was happy to vaguely threaten that to draw attention to his state's issues. And so are many states. Alaska, New Hampshire, Hawaii, Vermont. They all have active secessionist groups. And according to a Reuters poll in 2014, one in four Americans thinks that their state should secede. But there's something about California that seems to really breed these movements. And that, too, has historical underpinnings. You know, on the old maps of the New World from the 16th and 17th and even into the 18th century, California was often depicted as an island That's John Christensen, a professor at the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability and the Department of History at UCLA. He's also the editor of a quarterly magazine about California called Boom. It was imagined as an island uh, because California was first part of the Pacific world before it was part of the United States. And California was largely settled, not as we imagine, by people coming from the east, but was settled from the west, from the ocean, from the Pacific Ocean, and from the south, uh, from uh, Mexico, and then from the north as well, uh, with uh, some Russian settlements. And so California has always been a, a, a place apart, and in many ways an island. And California has some compelling arguments for wanting to leave the United States. Its economy is gargantuan compared to every other state. California has more people than all of Canada. It has access to the sea for trade. It has fertile farmland and it has plenty of energy options. And the folks behind Californian independence movements say that California is simply giving way more to the U.S. than it's getting. And John admits that, as a Californian himself, the idea of an independent California is pretty appealing. California's identity as a place apart has a long-standing history and, you know, a, a sort of vibrant salience today. You know, sometimes we imagine ourselves as the future that the United States is going to become, and sometimes we imagine ourselves just as different and separate. California is a force in the world. You know, the estimates vary and it depends on how you count the numbers. But if we were an independent nation, we'd be somewhere around the sixth or seventh largest economy in the world. There are lots of facts, you know, as well as, um, you know, appealing ideas that, you know, make the make the idea of secession appealing as a thought experiment. But when it comes to taking this whole thing from an idea to an actual movement, that is where John kind of backs away slowly. You know, I think the people who are pushing for secession, and I know some of them, and, you know, they've they've asked me to, you know, get involved with their campaign, and I've, you know, politely demurred. You know, it's not something that I'm, you know, going to actively campaign against, although I think that the idea is cracked. Um, I think it's fundamentally cracked. I think it's, I think it's, you know, I think it's appealing, but I think it's a waste of time. 
And everybody I talked to for this episode reminded me that we have, in fact, seen one other secessionist movement really happen in the United States. It started in 1861. The last time that was tried, it was arguably the biggest disaster in the history of the United States with the Civil War. The Civil War! You've probably heard of it. Over a million people died fighting in the Civil War, and the states that tried to break away lost. No. John says that the people of California have the right to rise up if they truly believe that being part of the United States is oppressive. What is contemplated in American um, history and in the Constitution is not secession, but revolution. You know, if California believes that being part of the United States is untenable, and, you know, we are not being governed well and it is oppressive. You know, we do have uh, the right as people to um, revolt and, and, and have a revolution. But when it comes down to actually picking up arms and fighting to leave the union, John isn't so sure that the folks pushing secession are quite willing to do that. I don't think that the United States would look favorably upon a real revolution in California. Um, And I don't think most Californians would either if they thought seriously about what the consequences of that would be. When we come back, we're going to find out what the people at the California National Party, one of the groups pushing for independence, think about all of this. Are they willing to take up arms to leave the U.S.? And if they are, what does that future look like? You can find out after a quick word from our sponsors. So we've walked through some of the past secession movements and how they went down. But what about the future? Isn't this podcast supposed to be about the future? It is. And now we are going to go there. Let's talk about a future in which California actually tries to secede from the United States. Now, the first thing I learned is that at least one of the California independence groups wants me to stop using that word secede. I will say, first of all, that we don't like to use the word secede because it it just conjures up a lot of ugly historical imagery of of civil wars and uh, belligerent secession movements and and failed separatist movements. And um, that's really not what, what we're going for, how we see it. This is Jay Rooney. He's the press secretary for the California National Party. The California National Party started early 2015. Well, it was just a group of like-minded individuals got together and thought, hey, you know, this independence thing is a good idea. How can we make this happen? The part then the party held its first convention uh, in the summer of 2016, where the current leadership was elected, and then another convention in the, that September when we adopted our platform. And we've been just going strong ever since. Uh, Certainly, um, the election has given us a great boost, as you can imagine. And Jay says that despite historical precedent, he actually doesn't think that California breaking away necessarily has to include a very bloody, terrible war. So um, about the Civil War, um, basically, the, the reason there was a Civil War then, and we don't believe there will be a Civil War now, is because the world is a much, much different place now than it was in the 1860s. So, for example, so the UN Charter, for example, lists political self-determination as a human right. So as a result, that's something that no government can deny. Uh, America declaring war on California after a peaceful and democratic vote in favor of independence would not only violate their treaty obligations to NATO, the UN, and more, but it would also crash the global economy. You know, doing so would be in no one's best interest. You know, and I find it really hard to believe that the U.S. government, even under a a Trump administration, would would be so foolhardy. So we plan to win independence by the through the ballot box. So here is their plan. First, become an officially recognized party. Then start running candidates on the CNP platform. First local stuff, then regional, then statewide. Then, once California National Party members are elected to a ton of offices in California, they run a ballot referendum asking the people of California, hey, do you want to leave the U.S.? And if that passes... Then our elected officials will begin the process of a negotiated exit with the United States. And this is 
is the part that I think a lot of people have questions about, myself included. So the idea here is that Californians vote to become independent. And then California, a state that brings in two and a half trillion dollars every year to the U.S., simply goes and tells the federal government that it would like to leave. And the federal government says, yes? Why would they say yes? Part of the platform for independence is that California puts more into the United States than it gets out. For every one dollar that Californians pay in federal taxes, we only get like 78 cents to 98 cents back, depending who you ask again, in federal subsidies. Why in the world would the U.S. be like, OK, sure, yeah, go ahead? I don't know. But Jay really does think that they will. From our point of view, we are absolutely serious and we absolutely believe that this can happen. So we know what one version of this future looks like. It's the one that Jay doesn't really want to consider. This idea that Californians might actually take up arms, raise an army and go to war for independence. I think we can pretty safely say what would happen there. Uh, And California doesn't really fare well. But what about this other option? What if, let's just say, what if, Jay and his crew managed to Jedi mind trick the U.S. into giving up control of a state whose GDP is more than double that of 46 of the other states in the Union? What happens then? Oh, this is, this is my favorite part. So after California, you know, after we vote on independence and the U.S. grants us independence, you know, then we would need a, you know, we need to convene a, a constitutional convention to draft a new constitution. Um, everything from, you know, from, from growth, but, you know, while also preserving the environment, you know, from school reform to create quality, uh, you know, equal opportunities for our young people, for a, a humane and sensible immigration policy, um, for, for judicial reform, you know, to eliminate police brutality and, um, and, and and reform our um, and reform the courts, you know, like and the drug war. Um, provide finally provide universal health care for all of our citizens. Uh, God, so 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 many things that could be possible, should be possible, but aren't possible now because we are part of the United States. And then, once they have their house in order, Jay would like to cooperate with the United States. So our plan is to absolutely remain friends and allies with the U.S. We want we want a friendly relationship with them. Of absolutely, we will we will trade with them. Uh, we will, you know, enter treaties with them. We will, you know, cooperate with with the military. And in fact, one of our one of our plans in the platform is our peace and defense platform. You know, which would call for kind of leasing, you know, leasing to them like the bases that they have now. Um, but yeah, we hope to we hope for a very cordial and productive and cooperative relationship with the United States after independence. Which is good because California sort of needs the U.S. for a couple of things. You know, I think in terms of water, if if, say, we were no longer able to bring water to Southern California from the Colorado River, that would be a huge problem. You know, that's a very, very important supply of water for Southern California. And it would also be, uh, you know, it would if we were not able to bring it in that water, it would. Um, it would dry up uh, the, the the great agricultural region known as the Imperial Valley and and the desert um, uh, east of east of Los Angeles. Now Jay says that he thinks the question of where California's water comes from is overblown. As far as water goes, well, California's water security issues are actually made worse by being part of the U.S. So I would argue that um, that our we're, we're never going to solve our water issues until. We leave. So if California secedes, sorry, becomes independent, it will elect its own officials, who Jay assumes will prioritize things like education and water resources. But a lot of what happens in this peaceful, independent future kind of depends on who gets elected to lead this new independent California, right? And here is where Jay's future could, in theory, go off the rails a little bit. The California National Party is not secretive about the fact that they are progressive. Part of their platform is about how California is a liberal state, consistently being bullied and overruled by conservative states. You know, we won't have to take orders from red states that hate us. But the idea that an independent California will be necessarily progressive is not really true, I don't think. California has plenty of conservatives. My grandparents, for example, are former farmers who live in the Central Valley, and they are incredibly conservative. So are all of their friends. 
I lived in California when the state passed Proposition 8, banning gay marriage. That proposition was reversed by a Supreme Court decision, but it puts a little bit of a crack in the idea that California is inherently a progressive state. When I asked Jay about this, his answer was that California conservatives are different than conservatives elsewhere. California conservatives are different than um, than the rest of the conservatives in the rest of the country. They're, they're very much, much more uh, of a libertarian bent. And there is, you know, then there's some commonality there with, um, you know, with California progressives and that in California, we pretty much just like to let people be, you know, and, and leave them alone. And yeah, you know, Prop 8, you know, did happen. But, you know, that was, you know, there's always exceptions to the rule. Now, regardless of whether California conservatives are different than conservatives in the rest of the country, an independent California will likely find that it is encountering the same issues that the United States has. This urban-rural divide that fuels so many of these secession movements. This fight between the more conservative rural areas and the more progressive big cities. And maybe it's better to fight those battles on a smaller scale within California. But those battles will not go away if California becomes independent. And if California does manage to exit the union peacefully, there are all kinds of upsides for the people who live there, right? They will probably pay lower taxes. They will be able to enter in climate change treaties with other nations and join the effort to curb emissions. They'll avoid being drafted into wars that the U.S. might fight. But one question I had about this future, which I've never really seen anybody address, is about tribal land within a newly independent California. What happens to people like the Hoopa, who live on a chunk of sovereign land in Northern California, if the state around them secedes? Do tribal nations go with California, or do they stay connected to the U.S., but are suddenly surrounded by a foreign country? Jay kind of assumes that the Native Americans in California would, of course, want to break away from the U.S. Um, I can't imagine them choosing to, to stay with them versus joining us or, you know, or becoming their own nation. But I think that things are a little bit more complicated than that. So I called someone who is an expert in tribal sovereignty. Well, I'm uh, from, I am a uh, member and even sometimes a citizen of the Turtle Mountain Chippewa tribe, uh, surrounded by the state of North Dakota for the most part. I uh, grew up on the reservation there, went to school and on the reservation lived in a federal housing project on the reservation, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I went to law school, and then I uh, ended up in Washington, D.C., working on the uh, Indian Affairs Committee, and have been here since, other than a couple of uh, short, you know, sort of stints away, one of which I was uh, elected uh, the chairman of, of my tribe. So, uh, you know, that's a, that's about it for my, I mean, I, you know, I don't know how deep you want to go in my background, right? I am not, but I don't think you want to hear about my favorite food or favorite color. Or anything. <laughs> this is Richard Monette, a professor of law at the University of Wisconsin and the director of the Great Lakes Indian Law Center. And he confirmed my hunch. It is complicated. But before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about what tribal sovereignty actually is. So when the United States was founded, uh, there were obviously people already living here. Native Americans have been here for a very long time. And colonists were uh, trying to colonize and take that land, and they didn't really know what to do. Now, it wasn't that they were asking, should we take this land? Of course not. They wanted to take it anyway. It was really a question about who was allowed to take tribal lands. Was it the states or was it the federal government? Tribes were here first. Uh, the uh, colonists came um, and uh, formed their institutions, colonies, and then declared themselves as free and independent states. Uh, they formed an, a confederacy, a confederation that didn't really work, largely because of the Indian question. They gave the confederation the right to acquire tribes' territory, but then they said as long as it didn't conflict with the states' uh, right to acquire territory. So then they're acquiring territory Uh, you know, at odds with each other, and so obviously that didn't work. So eventually they kind of come up with this weird agreement. So 13 years later, they make a union, right? 1789. And uh, in that uh, document, now the Constitution, they put in the Commerce Clause uh, as part of the legislature's power that uh, Congress will deal with Indian tribes, including acquiring territory. They essentially um, left the question open in some of their minds, but by the fact that they didn't expressly reserve it, they, they kind of knew what the answer was. They didn't reserve any power to acquire territory for themselves. So the problem under the Confederation, they resolved. They gave it all to Congress to acquire territory. 
And in the years following the Constitution, the question of tribal sovereignty continued to kind of get passed around and never really fully resolved. The federal government now recognizes 562 tribes as domestic independent nations, which is a little bit of a confusing thing. So tribes aren't like an independent nation itself. They're not like France or Spain. Tribes can't print their own money. They can't enter into treaties with foreign nations. Tribal lands essentially work a little bit more like states in the U.S. than independent nations, except that they don't have representatives in Congress or the Senate. But essentially, the agreement is between the federal government and these tribal sovereign nations. States really shouldn't be involved at all. But Richard says that the relationship between tribes and states is a weird one. Like, should tribal members vote in state elections if they belong essentially to a completely different state? These tribal members, especially the tribal ones, the ones in the reservation living among their people, they're not citizens of the state. Okay, well, here's the rub. But today, they all want to be. And they all say they are. And they all participate in state governance. And they all vote in the elections. And, and it's like they, sometimes it's almost like, well, this citizenship, this stuff, this is not a game, right? This is a very solemn sort of fundamental deep tenet of American theory and law that you are in a civic relationship with that state and with that government. You're part and parcel of that polity, which as soon as you say that out loud, well, that completely undermines sovereignty because sovereignty means that you're a distinct people's. So so you have that, that going on right now that supposing there was a secession today or, or, uh, or a d- dissolution of the union, and the first thing California would say is, well, what's, what's separate sovereignty? You're all citizens in our polity. You all vote here. You all uh, can make campaign contributions to, to state uh, candidates. Now, Richard says he gets why tribal people have gotten involved in their state politics. They're like, well, you know, we got that's the only game they're providing us, and so we got to play it. But then avoiding this question that I'm saying we got to start asking, what is the significance of that? What might be the implications of that? But let's say that California secedes, and the folks in these tribal nations want to keep their independence. Richard says that that could get really complicated. Uh, California would be entirely within its rights to say, for 50 years, you have exercised your rights as as a citizen of this state, as a member of this polity, and upon this dissolution, we don't see uh, any argument that, in fact, you are politically distinct from Californians. And the idea that Native people would, of course, want to go with California, that's not necessarily true. This isn't to say that the United States treats Native Americans well. They do not. But why would we assume that this new state of California would be better? It's, it's hard to imagine that there would be much more enlightenment by the states if, in fact, they did not have these federal rights and responsibilities, you know, sort of breathing down their backs like they have now. And, and to, to reiterate the point, like they sometimes have now, <laughs> sometimes it's not such a heavy breathing down their back. Uh, could they recognize the tribes? Absolutely they could. Would they be uh, as enlightened as they've been forced to be uh, under this federal system? Um, Probably not. And in some places, tribes have access to really valuable resources that a newly formed state might not want to give up. Then, you know, make no mistake, uh, among the, the top purposes and maybe objectives of American law, most American law, dealing with indigenous peoples has been to to separate them from their wealth, their resources, and to separate them from their polity, from their government. You know, some of those uh, tribes out there have some rather vast resources. But what if the tribal folks in California decide that they actually want to stay with the United States? What if they don't trust the California National Party or whoever comes to power in California and they'd rather stick with the devil they know over the devil they don't know? Could they still be part of the United States while being completely surrounded by California? That kind of puts them in a really vulnerable place, too. Yeah, it inevitably sets up the kind of conflict where one state becomes subordinate to another 
for a lot of reasons. Militarily, you know, economically, uh, a state could be strangled if I'm entirely surrounded by a state, right? Well, uh, you know, the, we could not allow cable uh, television to be uh, brought there, or we could stop the telephone poles and say you don't have electricity, or right? And, well, that's the situation now with tribes and states, and that's precisely what states do. You're not going to get your liquor or your cigarettes. You're not going to get your satellite lines. You're not going to get your T1 lines for your computer, high-speed computer. You're not going to get that because it comes through a part of this state, and so we're going to tax it and do other things. So it's possible to sort of politically, almost even culturally, but certainly economically sort of strangle that, that interior one. So, I don't know. It's complicated. The future is hard. But even the secession haters like John think that this kind of thinking is actually worth doing. As much as he feels that the whole California independence thing is a fantasy, he still likes thinking about it. I don't think that these dreams of secession will ever go away. And I think, you know, as a historian, we practice counterfactual thinking. You know, it's not going to go away. And it really does help us think as a thought experiment. You know, what is different and special about California? You know, why are we, le- you know, leaders now on, on these fronts? You know, what would it be like if we were, we were on our own? You know, how could things be different, either in a positive or, you know, not, not so positive way? I, I think that the task, you know, then is to, you know, is to come back to reality and say, you know, how can we use that knowledge to better play uh, our hand in the future of the United States? And if California did secede, they at least already have one key thing checked off their list. Well, we've got a great flag. It says California Republican. It has the bear on it. We already have the flag. We don't need to redo the flag. We're, we're prepared to be an independent country. Once you have a flag, I mean, what else do you really need? That's all for this episode. Thanks for listening. If you want to learn more about California secession or see what the different platforms are of the different California independence parties, go to flashforwardpod.com where I will put up links to more information. Flash Forward is produced by me, Rose Eveleth. The intro music is by Asura and the outro music is by Hasselonian. Special thanks this week to Samir Ajmani, Jade Davis, Brent Rose, Jim Basili, Carolyn Cinders, and Scott Musgrove. The episode art is by Matt Lubchansky. If you want to suggest a future we should take on, send us a note on Twitter, Facebook, or by email at info at flashforwardpod.com. I love hearing your ideas, and many of you wrote in to suggest this one, so I hope you enjoyed it. And if you think you've spotted one of the little references that I've hidden in this episode, email me there too. If you're right, I will send you something cool. Also, I will be at South by Southwest this weekend, um, not talking about Flash Forward, talking about my other job uh, doing sports documentary podcasts, but I will be there and I will have Flash Forward stickers. So if you want to say hi and you want one, um, just hit me up and we'll figure it out. If you want to support the show, there are a few ways you could do that too. Go to flashforwardpod.com slash support and you can see all the different ways that you can give me money. If you're not in a place where you can or want to give money but you still want to help, uh, go to iTunes, leave the show a nice review, or just tell your friends that the show exists. That helps. The more listeners I get, the more I can do. So um, that really does help. Okay, that's it for this episode. See you in the future.